we have this idea that it's noble to sacrifice. And once we get hooked on that idea, we never, ever prioritize getting in touch with ourselves first and foremost to give from there. Because the sacrificing mind is actually the disconnected mind. Mm. The only way you can see sacrifice is real is if you're disconnected. I'm Maureen Whitehouse. And I'm Christian Camarena. And this is Miracle Renegade. A podcast for you. So how are you doing today? Good, really good. Yeah. I had a dream today. Today's my birthday. Yay, yeah. it's your birthday. And uh, <laughs> I've been in like the support structure of my family for a while. And I had a really weird dream involving my mom. Mm. And I realized something about myself that most of the times that I'm upset with my mom, it's because I leave with the feeling that that wasn't me in the room after an argument. Mm. And... Can I just ask you to stop for one second? Yeah. When you leave feeling it wasn't you in the room, is it only after an argument or is it sometimes just being... Just being there, mm-hmm. yeah. Like I, I feel like I was transported back in time or I got angry the way I don't get angry or I appease people the way I don't appease myself. And uh, it brought me to... The question of what is empathy? Mm. Like, is it something that it's supposed to control me? Because I see that in my relationships with people. I see that in my roles with people. I see that in my roles with myself sometimes. And I feel like I can never escape it. Mm. No, it's a great, great way to begin this, talking about how you've been the support system of your family for so long, and it, which comes with a lot of responsibility, driven by love. But at the same time, the people who are the most loving and kind often find themselves getting burnt out, unexpectedly even, because they're giving it their all. So let's step back for a second and just look at this in a real objective way. Mm -hmm. Since it's so personal to you as well, it's great because it gives us like a real pointed focus on something that is so important for you and I'm sure relatable to so many people out there. Mm -hmm. So the reason I asked you if you only felt like you weren't being yourself when you were angry is because quite possibly you showed up not being yourself from the get-go. Even when you were happy, even when you were being helpful, you weren't necessarily being yourself because it was that whole little insidious performance thing. And so here's the difference. I'm going to make this really clear right from the outset. How to approach the role of caring and helping and being present, truly present for the people in your life who you love. So there are two ways that we move into relationships where we're the one that's the provider or the caregiver. And often that's colored by the perceptions of the world. So empathy is one way. Empathy is one way that people show up. But what I'd like to highlight is another way. You're going for the same goal, but at the same time, the approach is completely different. It's compassion. Mm. You can feel it right now. Get yourself in that space where you feel empathetic towards something. There might be something going on in the world or in your own immediate life that you can feel that sense of connection with from a heartfelt space. And it's that calling to kind of go in there and help or fix. Mm. There's empathy where you're meeting it directly, eye to eye, head on. And then there's compassion. And how I like to talk about compassion is that it's more of a top-down experience. It's not that you're aloof or distanced, but it's that you stay in heaven or in a peaceful place and you call people who are not at that moment as capable or fortunate or need the help or support of you at that time to join you. You don't leave a space that's peaceful or calm or in joy. It's more of a heavenly place, it's an uplifted space. And you staying there affords the opportunity for them to come up to meet you. Mm. Whereas with empathy, 
again, we meet them head on, face to face. So you're actually coming down to meet them in the muck and mire. Yeah. And feel how immediately there's a sense of resentment in there. It's very insidious and people don't realize it. Taking time for yourself to be in a space that feels centered and peaceful, that's very valuable for everyone. That's, that's really a whole-minded approach to life, to have this spaciousness that you can feel then that you've got the wherewithal to bring people and invite them into your world. Mm. But why leave it to come down into someone else's challenge and leave home? To do what? Bring them where? There's no home to get to then. Yeah. But uh, I guess I was very confused because when uh, a friend calls me over to talk or my job needs, I go there. You know, I'm in their space. How do I hold on to that peace? First, first, first part of this is really knowing when it's appropriate to move into someone else's space who needs help. And when it's not, when someone needs help, really sit back in your own space and feel that peace is the most important thing. If you're not peaceful, then you can't bring peace Mm. to the situation. Anybody who wants to be a miracle renegade has to know that we don't deplete ourselves in the process of helping others ever, ever. That's a rule here. That's a law here. Mm. That you always stay in that space where you're feeling fulfilled and full, and then you bring that sense of fullness into the experience, and then other people have you know a soft cushion to land on. But this approach of empathy that so many people are driven by is when you see and you see it over and over again. It's why we have the headlines we have, yeah. you know, where people are like, "Oh, that's so terrible. That's so tragic. How can we help?" You can't help from the place that the problem was created from. You just cannot. And so when you look at something objectively and then rise to the occasion, literally rise to the occasion, you go to a place where you can feel yourself viewing it more objectively, less judgmentally all around, you know, no perpetrator and victim in your experience at that point. You just are the bringer of peace. How do you do that unless you're in a peaceful place yourself? Well, if you're in the muck and mire of it, of the story, the thick of the story of it, then you have to extricate yourself enough to be coming from a peaceful place so that you can bring peace to the situation. Mm. And, And that looks like objectivity. It looks like awareness. It looks like addressing what's most valuable and important, even if 10 other people are busy, you know, putting Band-Aid after Band-Aid on something, you can come in and say, well, you know, I noticed, maybe we can address it from here. Mm. And, and you address it right at the source of the problem instead, which might not even have anything to do with the dramatic part of what's apparent in a situation. You know, that's all downstream. Where the problem is, is upstream. Yeah. There's a story about this where people are addressing these things that keep coming down the stream and they're always, you know, picking up garbage, piles and piles, massive piles of garbage and saying, well, we're doing our best. We keep, you know, pulling it out of the stream when it comes by, but nobody goes upstream to see where the garbage is coming from. Yeah. And when you're in that muck and mire of a situation, you can't think effectively or assess things effectively in a way that's heart-driven because you get brokenhearted after a while. If you turn around and see a big pile of garbage after every day, after day, after day, then you lose your own capacity to be impactful and to make a difference. And that's discouraging. Then you've joined into the hell of the situation. Hmm. So that's starting off from the top. But let's say, as most people are, You're stuck in the middle of it. Yeah. How do you navigate yourself in order to get to that top part? Really important. And this is where some of the qualities of a miracle renegade have to come in. You have to get really savvy at saying, make me your last resort. Hmm. When you're feeling, say, a sense of overwhelm or you only have so many moments in a day or you have several. If you're really good at this, by the way, helping others, you're going to have a lot of people who are always wanting help from you. Mm. Yeah. Because people who are genuinely heartfelt and and are helpful, 
there's a lot of people out there who need help. Mm. So this is super important, super important information for somebody who's a miracle renegade because we want miracle renegades to be able to be eternally happy and eternally vivacious and full of energy and, and joy and enthusiasm. And this is the number one reason why people lose their enthusiasm and become burnt out. Especially now, there are so many people who are caregivers for people who matter to them a lot. You know, people are aging longer in life now, but they are aging and lots of people aren't healthy for those final years. And then so people who had little responsibility for a while all of a sudden turn around and have to care for their parents and things. As well as their children. As well as their children and as well as the multiple other people who come out of the woodwork when you're a helping kind of personality. So I want to qualify this again, just say it one more time, maybe a little bit more clearly. There are two ways to approach this mission of being someone who helps. One is with compassion and one is with empathy. Mm. When you're being empathetic, it seems like such an important moniker to people because it's sort of like the red badge of courage. You know, you go in there and you're doing in the down and dirty the things that other people wouldn't do unless they had really big hearts and your ego can be all over this. It's virtue signaling. Yeah. And the ego loves to suck it up and be, you know, diminished by life because of others and be the victim to a cause and that kind of thing. And so the empathetic person, again, goes in eye to eye, sees the problem and runs right in to fix it and doesn't at all have the objective capacity to say, well, wait a minute, you know, am I really helping or am I just picking up one mess and putting it over to another place? Mm. Moving a mess from place to place, that happens so often, yeah. so often. But when you're in a compassionate place, not only do you get an aerial view, you're in heaven, so you're really approaching the solution from a place of joy and peace. Now you have a capacity to bring joy and peace. So being this little bit of selfish with a capital S, you know, self-oriented towards the higher self, towards the true self, Yeah. in that kind of heavenly space, whenever you're really feeling connected to the fullness of you, remember the soul, one of the number one traits of the soul is fullness. So you're giving from the overflow then. No one feels like you're being, like you're sacrificing for them. I have to tell you, everyone feels it. We all have this barometer that when someone's sacrificing for you, you feel like you owe them big time and like you're not capable of paying it back. Yeah. That's such a hard burden to bear for people. It's such a hard burden that often they don't even get well because they're so they're feeling so guilty for putting someone else out. So when you're coming from that place of compassion and you're totally full and you're given from the overflow, there's no guilt involved. Okay. And people don't then have self-judgment for being a burden. So see how healing that is right there? Yeah. And how important it is right there? Because if you come rushing in and all of a sudden you become depleted midway, or I know in my own life, my mother used to be amazing at coming in and doing things like helping with the kids and things when they were small. But then at one point she'd just burn out. Mm. And then boom, she was gone. And it was like, whoa, where, where'd Nana go? <laughs> what happened? And none of that was necessary if she had been connected to herself and, and paced it. You know, you have to give your all. And then what happens when you gave your all and 10 minutes later, you have nothing left to give and you're still in the scenario? Yeah. It's always good to reserve just a little bit. Anybody who's ever excelled in anything knows that they never gave their all to the point of depletion because then you become the victim that other people need to help. Yeah. And then it becomes a vicious circle. Everyone just relates victim to victim after a while. Mm. And I think uh, that's, that's where a lot of people are stuck in, especially people who are in despair or taking care of family, or, you know, even on like welfare, and they're helping out each other, disability. So when a system puts you in that mock, like disability, welfare, or even like loss of jobs, how can you find the compassion within yourself to look above that? Or is that the test? Like, what is that? Yeah, it's a great point about the system 
putting you in that label and then kind of keeping you there. The interesting thing is not one of us was left out from having a bright light within us that's connected to the source of everything. Everyone has an infinite capacity to rise above anything that appears to happen or take place in the world of form because this brightness is so brilliant and so awesome and so genius that we all have that all you have to do is empower a person to recognize and remember that they have this light within them. How you do that is by allowing them to have access to things that don't promote guilt or dependency, but look for that spark of light within people that's unique to them. See, we have such a problem with diversity that's at the core of all of this that people have always thought, I'm going to label somebody as better or less than based on their outer appearance or circumstances. Hmm. So someone comes to this country with little or no resources, even though they're genius or have that capacity to tap into this brightness within them, and they don't necessarily get the chance based on the way a system would assess them. So that's the reason why we have this podcast, to let people know that it's much more valuable not to pay attention to what the systems are offering. You know, use the leg up on the ladder that many of them do afford, but then take those resources and use them in a way that lets your light shine individually. Again, that might be a little more challenging in the beginning because of the way things are set up where diversity hasn't always been honored and revered and seen as the most powerful and amazing thing that it is, that this is a world of utmost capacity because of the diversity. So many contrasts to choose between. How amazing. That's what makes this life heaven on earth when you get it, that how to approach life happily is enjoying all the diversity. Yeah. But we see certain things as valuable and other things as not valuable. Certain people as valuable and other people as not valuable. The ones who are lit from within, who do see this and are aware of this, see everyone as powerful and amazing, potentially. And what they would do, someone who is aware in these situations, is set up programs that Allow for people to have more access to their infinite potential. Mm. No matter what they look like on the outside, no matter what the circumstances look like on the outside, every day people are continually reminded that they have a brilliant light within. What is that? You know, uh, when one of my daughters was small, I was traveling in India and I came upon a school at an ashram or a bindo ashram mm. in Pondicherry, India. And I was infatuated by this because I was doing work in the public schools with kids who had been killing each other, the troubled kids who had been victims and friends with the kids who did the killings as well. And so I had set up a, a program called The Course, Creatively Opening to the Resource of Self-Empowerment, knowing that our true nature is vastly creative, can create its way out of anything. So when I was in Pondicherry, came upon this school where the kids were literally taught, got them from a very young age, and they were taught, you're the light. You came with the light. You came with a specific purpose and a mission to this planet. And so our job as teachers, as administrators, as facilitators here in this school is just to help you find what your own unique purpose is. You will make your own curriculum based on what you love the most, we'll support you in every way, and we're going to find what your individual ray of light is. Interesting. These kids go on to be heads of state, lawyers, doctors, they're not crazy and, you know, woo-woo and out there, they find at an early age what and who they are and then are supported fully in that. You know, they would only take kids in that school till 11 years old mm. because they said after 11 years old, the mind kicks in, the judgmental mind kicks in, and we become too enculturated into society to want to know ourselves. We start to be focused, you know, and infatuated with the outer world. Oh, wow. Interesting. They had to wait till kids became 20 or in their 20s to want to know who they are out of despair or dysfunction often. And then, you know, they're ripe again. 
but there's a period of time between 11 and when someone's in their 20s that judgment starts to take over, fear starts to take over, and enculturation starts to take over, and we literally forget who we are. That's during uh, the hormonal phase. Yeah, exactly. It's like you kind of get taken over by the physical. And peer pressure is so huge at those ages and caring so much about the good or bad opinions of other people. It becomes primary. It becomes primal instinct that you could be, you know, extinguished by a group of friends, in quotes, friends, or anyone. It's a very precarious life at that point in time. And you care a lot about being in the tribe or in the collective. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we're all doing the best we can based on what we were taught. And so now let's just go back to your personal story for a minute. So you've been a primary caregiver for a mom who's a single mom and and your brother who's autistic, which comes with a lot of responsibility. Mm. And if you looked at it straight on with empathetic eyes, you'd say, wow, good guy. That's a big responsibility. That's a lot to handle. Yet you'd have to, at that point, be somewhat assessing the situation through judgmental eyes yeah. because you're not saying, what a fortunate guy. He's got these two bright lights who are so amazing and impactful. All he's got to do is keep reminding them who they are and, and moving in with love and joy, and then everybody wins. So watch yourself now. If you s- chose to be a little bit, in quote, selfish deliberately and consciously a little bit selfish in quotes so that you fill up first that might mean you know a little bit more meditation a little bit more time for yourself that's reflective a little bit more time in nature a little bit more time having fun yeah. i mean literally how are you going to have and impart a situation where they have fun if you forgot to have fun because you're so weighed down with responsibility now are these um is it like the recipe for peace? Is that what you're giving me right it's now? It's the recipe for consciousness oh, okay. and conscious relationships of all kinds. You know, this is an extreme example. When someone is a caregiver for someone else, there's a lot of interconnectivity there that has to be approached with awareness. And that's why I'm asking you about personally. If you consistently get set off by the same thing each time when you're with your mom or brother, what would you say is the most challenging for you to transcend in those relationships? It's how I feel about myself afterward. It sounds selfish, but I know that in that moment, it wasn't me. And I know that I can be above that. So I, I'm, I'm more disappointed in myself that... That you didn't show up. Yeah. But can you see now from what I just said? Yeah. How can you show up when you're coming with this model that other people say is a good guy coming in with empathy and being there for people who are having challenges and problems and feel how weighty it is? You know, it's not going to get better. It might get worse. There's all these things that when you come eye to eye, you can only see it body to body. Mm. And we're so much more than that. You're so much more than that. So if you come in automatically feeling that the situation is weighty or has a lot of responsibility to it, and yet you're not looking at responsibility as the ability to respond Mm -hmm. in a way that keeps you connected once you are connected, first and foremost, then the responsibility becomes how do you manage or micromanage or cope with weighty, heavy situations. Of course, that's not you who you typically are. So you're unconsciously pretending to be somebody you're not, weighted down by situations. The real you is always buoyant, is always full of light, is always bright, always has a tendency to be on the higher trajectory of life. The one who suffers and sacrifices the ego is always on a lower trajectory having its face dragged through the mud. That's what it loves to do, be a victim to a cause. So let's just step back for a moment. First step first, embrace yourself for doing the best you can. I mean, literally, right now, do it for for yourself and everybody else can understand this one if they've ever been in this position. First thing you have to do is be kind to yourself. How are you going to be kind to other people if you're busy beating yourself up for the problem that you felt last time or could possibly feel now or is in the making? 
reliving the past over and over. Ego loves that, keeps us in the past. It sounds like it is hell. Yeah. yeah. It's living hell because you never get a chance to advance and move forward into freedom because the ego just says, well, what does that look like? You don't know. Can't go there. We don't know what it is. Yeah. Because you're busy being disconnected at that point, listening to the voice that's the false voice of separation. Instead of approaching life with your mom and your brother with a total connection to first your divinity and then to them, which is nothing but connection, and then watch what happens ready for any kind of surprise or delight at any moment because the divine's doing it all because you're connected first in a vertical way. It's between the divine and you. The vertical connection comes from above down into you, which gives you like superhuman capacity. Truly, I'm talking to miracle renegades here. So you're going to have to own it. There are times when you have superhuman capacity just because you're so tapped in on a vertical way. That means you don't look with horizontal perception, which is past, present, future. It's a vertical perception that only has you available to now. Mm. doesn't matter what happened in the past, last week, last time you were with them, or whenever anything ever happened. It doesn't matter what's going to happen in the future because that's just malleable. Mm. It'll happen the way it happens. Big deal. And there'll always be another capacity to change or shift things in the future. So it's not even important. It's all taken care of by a benevolent entity that if you let go to, you're going to be just fine. And you have this vertical orientation that whatever's going on, it's between you and the divine. Now watch this. The divine feeds you with all this amazing capacity and and genius and light and patience and kindness supreme. Because it's never been labeled or formed into anything before. It's pure potential energy. And now you're bringing it down into your own being. That's what you do when you meditate or take some time in quiet or just be with yourself in a kind way. So how do you know that you're even tapped in? How do you know it's not like an ego trick? It feels like peace that's beyond understanding. Mm. It feels like peace that you didn't contrive in any way. It just came to you unaffected, untainted, undivided. It's just peace. That's why it's that peace beyond knowing because you can't quantify it. It just feels whole. It feels like home. It feels like you're at home in your own skin. And so that doesn't have any cause. It's just you accepting what's already available but that very often we in our human gyrations don't offer ourselves the capacity or time to tap. Mm. It's always available. So anybody here listening has the capacity to tap this. If you just be still and relax, just invoke it. Just say, okay, I'm I'm in the place now where I'm going to let myself have a vertical experience for a moment. Literally, that's what meditation at best is. You're just like letting yourself tap in to a vertical experience where it's the divine top down to you, unaffected, unfiltered divinity. Mm. And should you visualize this? Well, one of the good ways to visualize this is just pure streams of light, one big pure stream of light, almost like if you saw some of these, you know, space odyssey yeah. <laughs> kind of movies and things that beam me up light. Yeah. It's like that. They must have sat in a creative space to do something like, you know, create Star Trek. Yeah. That's universally appealing. It had to come from a universal mind. So beam me up. That could be a great way to <laughs> to do this. At times then, when you slipped a little bit, when you're with your mom or brother, and it feels a little stressful, you feel it coming on, even an inkling of it, great time to just sit for a second, take a breath, beam me up. Just let me get vertical for a minute. And then when you do that, it's anything but selfish. You tap into that universal energy that's not only your best energy or what's in your best interest. It's always win-win. Instead of overperforming or tap dancing too fast for your mom or brother that makes you exhausted and maybe is ineffectual because then we really get resentful when, in quotes, they didn't appreciate us because We're tap dancing so fast. We didn't stop to sit down and relax and see, is this appropriate now? Is this even appropriate now? Maybe you bring the same, you know, bagel in a bag every time you visit them and they never had the courage to tell you, we don't like bagels. Or every time you leave, I get a stomach ache from that. Yeah. Because you're acting so nice, but no one's tapped in. 
Everyone's just paying attention to the superficial things going on. So once you tap in, you give everyone else a sense of freedom because then you get this inspiration just to say, hey, do you like bagels? And then they'd be like, well, you know, we wanted to tell you for so long. And it's simple things like that. Simple things like that that can color everything of the experience. You went out of your way for you know five years to go get that bagel. And every time you bring it, you're like, well, why aren't they eating them right away? You know, why aren't they appreciative? And every time you leave, they have a stomachache and they don't even tell you. And all this drama for nothing, literally for nothing. And that's why once you do tap into this vertical experience, you start to realize that all the drama on earth is a bunch of nothing. Hmm. All of it is a bunch of nothing. You begin to then take things a lot less personally. You begin to take them a lot less seriously. And you begin to be able to assess them in a way that you know exactly where to insert yourself to be the greatest help. And you know exactly when to stay out of it and mind your own business so that somebody gets to maybe evolve past their own challenge or pain that they're in the midst of. And this is all through just time and and reflection and peace and meditation. It just kind of unfolds itself. Or are there any steps between this beautiful life that you're describing and the current present? Yeah, there are lots of steps that we'll have to take, you know, each one and, and unpack them during future podcast episodes, but I'll say them, you know, in a short way here, the cliff notes. First one is self-reflection. Truly sit with yourself, have the courage to sit with yourself and say, who am I? Past all the labels and the taught perceptions of yourself and the enculturation and all the things that you think you might be just based on other people's good or bad opinions. Be able to sit with yourself with a kind and embracing attitude that's patient and lets you just sit and say, who am I past all of these labels that are limited? Mm. And, and then be able to sit with yourself and say, who am I when I'm not being myself? You know, and without judgment, without self-judgment and without all that pain that comes along with assessing and feeling guilty. Because when you're not being yourself, you just slipped. Mm. You're just missing the mark. It's not a big deal. You can self-correct without the judgment or guilt as long as you're saying with a courageous intention, who am I being when I'm not being myself? And you'll notice that's what you feel bad about when you leave your mom and your brother. You weren't being yourself. Yeah. Just like you said, how we began this conversation, you notice you're not yourself. Well, the art is spending enough quality time with yourself that you notice what that looks like before you engage in relationship with other people. Hmm. And then you don't project all the problems onto them. You notice, hey, wait a minute, maybe they wouldn't have acted that way if I hadn't have showed up first, not being myself. Hmm. Yeah. And so we take a bit of responsibility instead of all the responsibility for somebody else's actions, you know, your brother or your mother or anybody else you're helping. You take the time, the quality time with yourself to notice and take responsibility for your own actions. Literally, that's all you can ever take responsibility for anyway, Mm. our own actions. We're in our own skin. The primary relationship we have is the relationship with ourselves. That affects every other relationship we have on the planet, whether it's with a rock or your next door neighbor or your mother or your brother. The only way we show up is showing them, illustrating to them, what kind of relationship we happen to have with ourselves. Mm, yeah. Like a, a story that you tell yourself. If you hate yourself, you're going to find a lot of relationships that will make you a victim. Okay. And if you are not kind or patient with yourself, you're going to find a lot of relationships that cause you to become impatient. Mm. The ego's um, art of living is to project all our problems onto other people, make them responsible for what we don't own within ourselves. Mm. So we get a chance to see how life unfolds around us based on our perceptions and orientations within our own little world. Mm. So this is important right now. I'm going to put a gold star on it. 
When you take responsibility for your own life and your own actions in a kind, loving, objective way, when you start to observe yourself with interest, with superior interest, I mean, this is your life. This is the most important story you're ever going to hear. It's your own life. When you start paying attention to your own life's story with interest, and don't try to fix or change yourself, please, 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 that is not the miraculous path. You are already perfect. You just don't know it. And that's why you're not acting that way. So the more we try to fix ourselves, that's an ego approach to this. Just observe yourself without trying to fix yourself first. So that let yourself get angry if you're prone to anger. But this time, watch with interest in a way that you're having a vertical experience. You're letting the divine shine the light on what it is that causes you discomfort and pain that has you get angry. And you'll start watching how you disconnected from the divine at some point, thinking it was noble. Mm. You stopped thinking it was important for you to feel peaceful first and foremost and loved first and foremost before you can go into a relationship and expect there to be peace and love in evidence. Mm. And it's a, it's a crazy orientation that the ego will never let you see the root of. It's so much easier than people think. It's relax. The one who relaxes the most wins. The one who spends time with themselves, not performing, and allowing themselves to objectively view what the motivations are in their life, whether it feels peaceful or not peaceful, it's very black and white, peace or not peaceful, based on your own experience within yourself, not the good or bad opinions of other people. Once you start realizing what genuinely feels peaceful to you, then your own gifts have a chance to express and emerge. You might be the greatest diplomat and you instead were angry every day of your life at the people in your life because you never tapped into the true you and realized what an awesome diplomat you are. Not only are you great and engaging and fun and funny, you're your win-win personality, and instead you've been showing up angry every time in a relationship with them. Why? Because you were disconnected from your greatest gifts. See, we have this idea that it's noble to sacrifice. And once we get hooked on that idea, we never, ever prioritize getting in touch with ourselves first and foremost to give from there. Because the sacrificing mind is actually the disconnected mind. Mm. The only way you can see sacrifice is real is if you're disconnected. Otherwise, if you are connected and you show up connected and stay connected while you're in relationship, you'll see that everything's already given. Inspiration's already given. Peace is already given. Love is already given. These are qualities of the soul. Yeah. And all you're doing is showing up soul-based, soul-oriented, which is what everybody wants because that's what feels like home. The home we always leave to live in this world. And then we constantly say there has to be something more. So why are people so afraid to see this? I know that we can blame the ego, but if if my arm is broken and I'm in pain, I'm going to fix that arm. Why is it that uh, this this part of my life where I refer to everything outside of myself, why is that more comfortable than looking within? You, you just said something really important, by the way. You said, if my arm is broken, it's going to get my attention. I'm going to fix that. That's the reason for all pain in life. Mm. The thing that causes us the most discomfort is what we look at. Mm. The challenge is that there's too many people here that are ready to slap on some kind of outer comfort. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a story about me when I broke my arm, mm. broke my wrist. So you can see what's the different approach to this. So I was caring for my parents aging and nearing the ends of their lives. And I came back to the Northeast to help care for my parents. And also, you know, doing the work that I do, I wanted to progress my effect on people in life. And so I started going to Harvard for graduate school just as a placeholder. (laughs) So I had something important enough to keep me anchored here while I cared for my parents who were in Connecticut. And so I go back and forth to my parents and starting my studies at Harvard, which were intense. Yeah. I was used to being a mystic mind, which is spacious and open to everything, and only one-pointed focused on peace or the things that matter the most to you, whereas 
intellectual education is very linear. Mm. And so it was two different minds. I was seeing actually if this was possible for a mystic to do. <laughs> and, and I realized it was actually pretty challenging to let myself analyze and, and be in that what they call argument mode for making a point in, in scholarly world. I never would, would ever pursue an argument in my life as a mystic because I know that that means you have to be taking sides in a world where you only approach it as win-win. But so there were the challenges of that. And I was just like kind of getting my feet wet in that whole world. And my parents started becoming more and more dependent on me. I was going as a ball of light. I was going in a peaceful way that I was really happy to kind of come full circle in my relationship with these people who meant so much to me and give them the care and attention that I knew they gave to me as a baby. I had watched them with my own kids and saw how attentive they were to babies and children through, through their grandchildren. And I said, you know, I didn't know when they were caring for me to that degree and how selfless that was. So I can help them at the end of their lives when they get more childlike themselves. And so I, being a mystic, wasn't really feeling how much was on my plate. I was just going with the flow, being in the moment. And one day I was on the phone with a client and he was an MD. He said, the, I was in the emergency room today and it was intense. And, you know, there were people being argumentative. And he starts to describe the, the whole situation in the emergency room. And I said, well, when I began this work, I made a pact with the divine that I would never speak about anything I don't have personal firsthand experience with. Mm. And I'm not a doctor and I usually use alternative medicine. So I've never been in an emergency room. So I can comment on the things going on, the chaos going on, but I can't comment on the particulars of the emergency room. And so we began and finished our conversation. And it was a beautiful evening. It was in like October. And I said, well, I have to get a spice. So let me take a walk through the park and go towards Whole Foods. And so I began my walk, had on, you know, running shoes. So no problem there. And as I'm walking, I get close to Whole Foods. And I fell, just flat out fell on both my arms. And I broke both my wrists. And the only reason I knew it was so bad is because when I looked up, there was a bus going by. It was rush hour. Mm -hmm. And everybody on the bus had their hands to their mouth, was like, oh, my, oh my God. God. I could see the whole bus just like saw me and just was in horror because I went flat down on both of my wrists. So I got up and I felt dizzy and that had never happened to me before. So I went to the gas station that was right there, sat down in the chair in the gas station and started to feel woozy. And I said, I think I need some water. The guy ran to get some water and someone else at that point is standing over me. And he said, can I help you? And all I could see was his legs because he was right in front of me. And I looked up and I said, who are you? And he said. I'm the ambulance driver. I just saw you fall. I was getting gas. <laughs> so, he, so he puts me in the ambulance and takes me to the hospital, to the emergency room. <laughs> this is only like 20 minutes after I had the conversation with my client. And so I'm in the emergency room and I'm watching everything thinking, you know, this is very interesting and surreal. Mm -hmm. And the Women who were the nurses, I think, or the, you know, the attendants, whoever they were, I'm not really exactly sure who's who in the emergency room, came up to me after I had got the star treatment, by the way, because when you come in with an ambulance, you go directly into one of the rooms. You don't wait in the waiting room or anything. And it was packed. So I'm watching the things going on. And one of the nurses or the nurse practitioner comes up to me and she says, well, they're obviously broken. Do you want anything for the pain? And I said to her, well you know, you tell me they're broken, right? And so that should be painful. That makes sense to me. So no, I don't need anything for the pain because wow. it's, that means I'm working. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if it's painful and I broke my arm. She looks at me and she calls the other nurse over and she <laughs> says, she just said she doesn't want anything for this pain. And she points to the woman across the way and says, that one has been screaming for pain medicine for the past half hour and she has nothing wrong with her. <laughs> And you don't want pain relief here? And I said, no, that makes absolute sense to me, actually. And I'll deal with it until I deal with the rest of this. So 
that was beside the point. That was just an aside. Yeah. Because I do believe that pain is relative. That's for another conversation. But when I got back home and had the cast on the arms and all that kind of thing, I realized, oh my gosh, I could not any longer drive to Connecticut. I realized I needed a break. I was trying to like fit in new life at Harvard, going to classes and going back and forth to my parents. And literally they got to the point where they liked me being around so much that they were calling and asking me to go back and forth in one day. Yeah. And, and I didn't know how to say no. Mm. So you don't give unless you're peaceful Mm. because otherwise you're going to need a break. And that might look like (laughs) a true broken arm, obviously, if you take a mystic's view of things. And so I can say from my firsthand experience that we have to really get practiced in knowing what peace feels like for us individually. Mm. And even if we can be superhuman, you know, and, and take on a lot, because you will be able to, the more miraculous you get, the more you're going to be able to take on. And you have to, at that point, be very discerning because the divine actually gave me a wonderful break then. For two months, I couldn't drive to Connecticut. I could be present for my parents, talk to them on the phone, but could empower them to do the things that I would have had to do in person had they got super, ultra, uber dependent on me. Yeah. And things worked out much better. I got to kind of get myself in a groove where I hadn't been able to when I was going back and forth, you know, writing a paper at two o'clock in the morning while I was taking care of them all day. And then they go off happy, you know, gardening or things. And I'm a wreck for the rest of the next two days trying to fit everything in that I had with full-time clients as well. Yeah. So the divine never asks us to overextend ourselves. Overextending is always of the ego. Remember, we talked about this in another podcast episode. We have this miracle prayer that will always tap us into miracles or this miracle intention or miracle mantra. First, sit down, tap in, relax, breathe. The breath is your connection to soul or to spirit. You came in to this life with your first breath. You'll leave with your last. Once you tap into that space where you're connected to that, light of you, the lightness of being, the breath is your lightness of being, then you can say, tell me where to go, tell me what to do, tell me what to say and to whom, and I will to do it and nothing more. Mm. Me going to Connecticut back and forth might have looked really loving to my parents, but it wasn't loving to me, obviously, Mm. and I obviously needed a break, and I obviously at that time needed a big wake-up call because I I literally had to just be where I was and then get in that groove that made me more aligned with peace. Mm. All right. So to get to a place where you're tapped in, you have to be aligned with peace. Yeah. There's no getting around this, by the way. If you want to be living a miraculous life, if you want to be living the most effective life, the most peaceful, centered, happy life for yourself, And this vertical experience of living is key. Mm. When you tap in vertically, then you're in that space where it's literally like the fire hose is on. The divine will give, 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 give. We only have to receive. The art of awakening, the art of aware living is getting really good at being receptive. Mm. And receiving from this vertical orientation first before you give. Mm. And then stopping when you're told to stop. Mm. Because sometimes the ego wants to edge everything out, edge God out, edge everyone else out. So you want to be the best caregiver. Yeah, You want to be seen as the guy who can sacrifice more than anybody else on earth. Instead, let yourself realize we're all the same. Literally, we all are tapped into the same source, just some people can receive better than others. Some people can be more selfish than others with a big S, Mm. where they prioritize that vertical experience above all others. And then when they show up in life to other people, it just looks awesome. Mm. We get to hear about this in future podcast episodes about how this feels to you when you go in knowing that your vertical experience with yourself is the most important, especially here's a rebirth on your birthday. Yeah, right. <laughs> you get to prioritize your own life first and foremost, 
knowing that when you really feel tapped in, you are tapped into an ever abundant source of everything, mm. everything, insight, grace, peace, ease, joy, fun, every good quality of everything in life you've ever wanted truly is real. It's just ours for the receiving and the giving. That's the best. When you start to be able to receive and give simultaneously, yeah, that's when what you know we've had saints and sages who've talked about being a channel for the divine or showing up and and being divine themselves. The best masters at this, uh, Jesus, the Buddha, all kinds of major, major awake and aware masters of this knew that when they were in a physical body, all they were doing was receive, give as one action. Mm. They were literally in a vertical experience and nothing else where the divine was their pilot. And they were just being a co-pilot. The divine would tell them where to go, what to do, what to say, and to whom. They'd do it and nothing more. Mm. That's literally what it looks like. And that's the mode of operandum. If anybody wants to open the hood and see under the hood for what it's like to be a divine being, this is it. Mm. They're living a vertical experience where their connection to the divine is first and foremost priority always. When they feel it a little bit off, a little bit overextending, or a little bit victim, or a little bit sacrificing, boom, back in alignment. And that was actually the whole message of our mistaken identity that we put this cross image of Jesus in so many churches. It was never about that. It was about notice people. I'm being crucified and I still rise. Yeah. How do you do that? Well, you don't pay attention to the pain. You pay attention to the resurrected energy, the powerful energy that's flowing, that's eternal. And you're going to come out the other side, no matter what it is you're experiencing. But being aware is the bonus. Being aware while you're in process, you know, being aware in that emergency room for me of what was going on as I watch, you know, that's just, there aren't coincidences like that in my world. Yeah. Hang up and say, I've never been in an emergency room. And then you know, 20 <laughs> minutes later, I am. Whenever those things happen, I pay attention and I know there's a gift being given to me from the divine. I might like a little drama from time to time. And so it's pretty obvious and blatant that, you know, you didn't need to break your arm here, Maureen, but you needed a break and you weren't listening. <laughs> Slow down, relax, receive. And you'll know that other people are doing just fine. You're not the only one in the world. In my path to awakening, I used to pay attention by being in meditation and then just having a pen and a piece of paper there where I could listen to things that I might, they might be a little bit obscure and nebulous and I couldn't really hear what was saying clearly. So I'd start to like, just be ready to write down what I was being told. And one time I got told, you're not the purveyor of the universe. Mm. I had no idea what purveyor meant. So I had to look it up and it was the one who's in charge of everything. It's the person that thinks they're in charge of everything. Okay. And I looked at my life at that particular moment. My kids were small and I had so many irons in the fire. And literally, I thought I was in charge of my universe. Yeah. That was the most powerful and impactful thing that could be said to me at that time. Relax. You're not the purveyor of the universe. Don't take on that you have to do everything. The more you relax, the more the room the divine has to do it for you. Mm. For you, with you. That's the home we always wish that we didn't leave. Yeah. And we think we're dropped. We think we're separate. We think we're disconnected because of that voice of separation of the ego. Constantly telling us, you're not good enough. Perform more. Then you'll be worthy. That's when you show up to a lot of work, especially to people who you love. And that's the muck of it. That's the muck. That's the muck. So I hope I gave the the most important and valuable aspects of that as, as it relates to this particular scenario. Mm -hmm. But you can see it could be overnight because, you know, lightning bolts can hit and strike and you can wake up in an instant. Everybody has the capacity to do that. But the divine never gives us more than we can handle. Mm. So the best route to having something like a lightning bolt hit us where we awaken overnight is to walk ourselves to the door, to the gates of heaven, incrementally, what feels most peaceful. We're never pushed and prodded by a goading voice. The divine truth and the voice of the soul is always embracing and loving, never promotes guilt or judgment. 
always is in a place where you're just fine. Just relax. You're just fine. Mm. And then there's this. The more you relax, the more there's of this. So it's it's a very uh, loving, kind, enticing voice that always lets you know there's more, there's more, mm. there's more in an ever-expansive, eternal universe. But take your time, relax. It'll always be there. It's eternal. There's no rush here. We're all going to wake up. Every single one of us is going to wake up and see that this was a crazy ass dream sometimes <laughs> that makes you crazy. And we're all doing the best we can. But when we're looking at it from superficial orientation or from the eyes that feel separate, you're over there and I'm over here, then often it's a challenge to negotiate. So first thing we do is we wake up in the morning and even keep our eyes closed and allow ourselves to just feel that we're in that, you know, beam me up now mode. Mm -hmm. Let me feel connected. Let me feel like I'm at one with the source of me, the true source of me, so I don't feel depleted and I don't feel like I'm running in place and panting to get to the next thing that I don't even know what it is, but it must be better than this. You know, um, that orientation is never going to make us show up for other people. In a healthy, happy way. Yeah. Can you see any way that you now, after this conversation, would show up to your mom or your brother just a little bit differently? Is there any kind of little tweak you feel that's natural to make? Something that feels like just even the tiniest little thing that you might shift or do to make this start to become your reality, that you can show up with an abundance of energy that overflows into their lives in loving, happy ways? Yeah, actually. Instead of uh, showing up in an environment where the typical plays out, invite them into like a sunny day. Mm -hmm. Do something fun. Pull out that part of themselves that they normally don't see. And yeah, like enjoy the day and relax. Really wonderful because you won't be able to do that unless you're feeling empowered to do that yourself. So how fun because then that means that you're receiving and you're giving. You're receiving first before they get a chance to experience it. You have to receive it first. You have to be aware of the sunshine or the breeze or whatever it is that you want to share with them. Mm. So again, let's get to that little most important golden nugget here with regard to being someone who is a caregiver. It's always going to be more powerful to approach relationship with someone who you're caring for with compassion rather than empathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy sucks you into the story or the drama that's been already present in time and space, and it's that ego continuum, the horizontal experience. Compassion is a vertical experience that is heaven down. You're pulling them up to heaven. So showing up for a sunny, happy, breezy day, you're pulling them out of the muck and mire into heaven. Mm. You know, at first they might not be used to it. So they were like wondering, when's the shoe going to drop? When's he going to, you know, get practical and pragmatic here to help us? Instead, stay deliberately in heaven. Hold on to that till you feel them arrive. You feel them get more buoyant. You feel them get more optimistic. You feel them rising in their capacity. And, you know, the fun thing will be for you if you haven't done this before, I know there's probably been multiple times you have just by default. All of us connect to soul every now and then, even despite ourselves. Yeah. But what you're going to notice is they bring so much more when they arrive in heaven that they never knew they had. So the work and struggle becomes obsolete. It's, it's just annihilated. Because when you bring someone to heaven, all of a sudden they're buoyant. Their genius arrives. Their best self is in evidence. And they start being a gift to you. It's such a win-win situation that people don't recognize. There were times when I did this with my dad. You know, he could be very challenging and, and stubborn. And he was very opinionated and had his ways of doing things. And as he aged and was moving on to his next adventure <laughs> out of his body, he started to be more um, malleable and... Mm. And so sometimes I just do things with him that were heavenly in their orientation. And I'll tell you, he would show up and start telling stories about the most fun parts of his life. And he would, you know, suggest we go out and get ice cream. And he would just become this delightful person to be around. But if you joined him 
in the muck and mire by sacrificing or being somebody who is just being a good caregiver in the tangible, practical, pragmatic way. Oh, man, could you be exhausted fast? Mm. He would buck you like a Bronco. <laughs> and, yeah. and he did that often with one of my sisters. She would be like, this is so hard. And, this is, and I'd be laughing away a weekend with him. Mm-hmm. And then she'd come back and be thinking how hard and full of struggle it was. And he just picked right up on that and brought her to the hell that she came in with (laughs) and stayed there. But she didn't know that because she wasn't in heaven with him enough to notice what a different person he was when he was in heaven instead Mm. of hell. It's interesting that even uh, with what you've seen in this life, you've awakened. It's interesting that you still fell for doing too much yeah it's it's one of the ones that follows you to the top of the mountain by the way it's Mm. why you you know when someone awakens they want win-win for everybody the reason we're doing this podcast we want people to know what it's like to be free yeah everyone wants to be free when you finally know the road there or you've experienced it to any degree yourself you want to share that And it's a very enthusiastic intention, but you're still in one physical body. And I will tell you, you know, people can show up in hordes that need help. And you have to be very clear on how much you have at that moment to offer. So I'll just give a very simple example. You know, I woke up when my kids were still small. And we always answered the phone. At those times, there weren't all of these robots calling. There were some, but when someone called, you answered the phone. And once I woke up, people started coming to me, you know, word of mouth, even total strangers. And so one night we were sitting down to dinner and the phone rang and I said, don't get it. We have an answering machine. The answering machine can get it. And I started recognizing that if I didn't have my quality time with my family in peace and ease, then no one else got the best of me. Yeah. And yes, you can be awake, but you're always awakening. This isn't a noun. This is a verb. Mm. And so you're going to always learn more and more and more. And that's why you invite in the contrast without fear. Mm. That's why I invite in. Let me feel what it feels like to have a broken arm without, you know, somebody else telling me I need to be anesthetized. I enjoy experience. I don't care if it seems to be, in quotes, good or bad. It's experience. What's the contrast hold for me? And so when I'm, you know, sandpapering the edges or fine-tuning something, there'll be things that I realize that I didn't know before. The things that I'm speaking about now, I've learned over 23 years of experience of being awake. And what that means is you're not Sleepwalking through life. Yeah. You're noticing all of those little innuendos. When you're not judging other things, you can assess things accurately. If you're a judgmental person, you assess nothing accurately. Mm. People don't know that. But being an awake person, I've noticed that at any point in time, if I had any inclination to judge, I fell asleep in that moment. Mm. So that's why you see aware people are typically apparently giving and benevolent because you have a lot more energy when you're not judging. Yeah. You have a lot more capability when you're not judging. That's why, you know, I could go back and forth to Connecticut and still do work on a Harvard degree. But there was still that little part of me that did perform for my parents or else they never would have had to give me such a dramatic, Maureen, you need a break. Yeah. I, you know, I have infinite energy. I'm typically tapped in and yet, That was my mother and father. Mm. And we get conditioned into all kinds of things like, you know, they could guilt trip me when I was little. Yeah. And they could tell me, you know, whether I was good or bad when I was little. Mm. So that wasn't the divine telling me to go there, you know, back and forth in one day. I was even listening to... I was doing the something more, I think. My parents didn't really understand me very much once I woke up. I was... pretty different person. I wasn't codependent anymore. But this highlights the degree of codependence I had. I had a way of caring more about their good or bad opinions than anybody else on the planet. 
this is minimal, minuscule compared to what I used to do for my parents to, to prove my love for them and for, you know, my worthiness of being on the planet. So that was just a little bit of sandpapering, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> Dramatic way <laughs> to receive the sandpapering. Not just one, but two broken and fractured arms. <laughs> Can't do much with that. <laughs> Not even a swig of whiskey, nothing. <laughs> Not even a swig of whiskey. <laughs> I did go home for, I remember going for some rescue remedy of the homeopathic rescue remedy. And when I tried to take it off the shelf, it fell out of my hands and smashed all over oh. the floor. <laughs> so I didn't even get a rescue remedy to help me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But wonderful, wonderful question. And I love showing my human foibles to be able to illustrate it for people more uh, more clearly. Yeah, I think that's very important. You only hear about the myths, you know? Mm -hmm. You always hear about how, yeah, the Buddha was divine and birds landed on him. But you never hear about his stomach aches or yeah. anything. I remember feeling so happy when I heard a story about Paramahansa Yogananda, major yogi, one of the first yogis in the 1940s to come to America, still with his saffron robes and things. And he'd speak. He learned a lot about the Bible so that he could speak to groups and churches and things. Mm. And so he used to be so strong in his will power that the way he enticed people to learn about yoga was that he'd line up. 20, 25 men on a stage and he'd stand at the end of them and he'd say, just put your hands on my stomach and each man would have their hands on I mean, back to back and he'd just flex his stomach and they'd all fall over. That's Whoa. how powerful his will was because he was totally aligned with the divine. Wow. He also said that he had a challenge because he had a little bit of a belly. He had a belly. Mm -hmm. And so... He said he had a challenge because he, people invited him over all the time for dinner because he was Paramahansa Yogananda. And he said he loved food. He had a hard time yeah. to say a no. And I loved hearing that, that the same person who could knock people over with their belly still had a challenge <laughs> sometimes of overeating a little bit because he didn't you know, want to say no. So, so everybody can give themselves a break here and relax. You yeah. know, you're always climbing to the top of the mountain here. And even when you get a chance to just notice the vista from the top, you're still going to go. This is eternal. This is no end. You're always going to expand. There'll always be more. Hey guys, if you like the show and you want to comment about your own meditation practice, uh, leave a comment below. <laughs>